patients are transporting the fit pre-weaned calf as well as the market cow. So kind of looking more at the environment of these animals as we haul them from point A to point B. And I think one of the key things we want to remember is this is also part of enrichment. So an environmental enrichment, providing an area uh, for the calf that is safe for them or for the market cattle so that they come into the, uh, from the farm to their next location, injury free and less stress as it comes about. But when we think about animal welfare and we think about cat fit for transport, again, the definition as provided by the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, that an animal is in a good state of welfare if, as indicated by seven scientific evidence, that the animal is healthy, she's comfortable, well-nourished, safe, and able to express innate behaviors, such as grooming behaviors, natural feeding behaviors, and she is not suffering from unpleasant states, such as pain, fear, or distress. And that really drives kind of what we talk about and try to strive to provide our animals when we're talking about animal welfare. And when we look at fitness for transport, again, as defined by the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, fitness for transport is really an animal's ability to withstand transportation without compromising their welfare so that they're stress-free, they're hunger-free, uh, injury-free, and that they're in a safe environment that they can have natural behaviors like lying down or standing or approaching a ramp to load on or off a trailer. So again, fitness for transport is really about making sure that animal can withstand that transport without compromising her welfare. And we do know that transportation or transport of animals is a complex operation um, and has many facets, including how we handle them, how we load and unload those animals from the trailers and onto maybe the receiving docks at some of the barnyards or uh, other operations. Loading and transportation also gives them unfamiliar environments that they're not familiar with, example, within the actual trailer itself or at their end location that they're being transported to. Transportation can also provide isolation of those animals and causes social disruption if we're commingling animals that are not familiar with each other from the same pens or even the same farm. We also have confinement issues, loss of balance as we're transporting animals. A fluctuation in temperatures, especially this time of year with the cold temperatures and the wind uh, potentially as we're transporting these animals. Exposure to pollutants like exhaust fumes if we're sit sitting idling on the road or just idling loading the trailers. And then in some cases, feed and water withholding uh, depending on the length of transportation. So when we look at the importance of fitness to transport, there's kind of four things we really want to focus on. And for the most part, foremost, we want to ensure the survival of the animal to the final destination. And not only the survival of the animal, but the thriving animal, uh, whether it's going to a custom heifer raiser, another farm operation, or to the processor or to a sale barn. We want to ensure that they have a good transportation and survival of that animal that's injury free. Also, especially with our market cows or even beef animals, we concern about carcass quality. Research in the past and why BQA came into existence was a lot of carcass or meat damage was done with animals with poor handling skills, uh, hitting uh, gates or getting pinched in between the gate and the posts as they go through, or the door to the trailer not being open wide enough, um, which does cost meat to be bruised and potentially condemned, losing money for our processors. Transportation, if we do it right, we want to reduce the long-term health issues and stress. And as we know that a part of animal welfare, as Jennifer shared earlier, was that we want them to be able to cope with stress better and with less stress, they can have better long-term health issues. And foremost, and we want to ensure consumer safety with the product that uh, we are producing, whether it's a milk or meat product for the consumer. So it all goes around from the farm to the locations in between, all the way down to the consumer, the importance of fitness for transport. So the first part of this presentation I was going to share is the fitness for transport when we're looking at the pre-weaned calf. 
And the stress of calf transport, we do recognize there is some stress and how they measure stress uh, is basically the cortisol, which is also known as the stress hormone. And we do know based on research is stress is measured through that elevated serum cortisol levels. And uh, based on a fact sheet from Ireland's uh, Agriculture and Food Administration, that if they are properly managed pre and post transport, we can see that the cortisol levels can decline within 12 hours of transports in those calves, they've seen levels remain high as up to as much as nine days post-transport, which then suggests that those animals have a longer period of time to adapt to their new environment. Because not only do they face stress during transport, they also may have additional stressors as they're accommodating or acclimating to their new environment. And when we think about the impact of stress, when we talk about calf transport, there is concern of dehydration and body weight loss from not having a feed or water access for the longer hauls. Or we could see episodes of bovine respiratory disease in that we have stress and the immune system is compromised. In some rare cases, we can even see mortality of these young calves. One of the things we want to share is like talking about standards versus guidelines for fit for transport and the difference between the two. So standards are in place, which are legal requirements. And we can see that in the European Union, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand. And these legal requirements dictate what it is to require to transport a bob veal calf, a dairy calf, pre weaned calf, or other type of young animals. Even the age at time of transport, the whether a navel is completely healed, whether the transportation is short or long distance and the duration of that before stops, not to exceed so many hours. Also, the fact that if they do have to stop between stops for rest, they must stop for a minimum set of hours between that. They also have requirements about the space available to the calf during transport and actually how to load those animals. Also, there's requirements on what the, the needs to be done to the calf prior to transport, including adding uh, feeding liquid feed prior to loading, as well as colostrum management and processing the newborn calf. However, in the United States, we don't have standards established, but we have guidelines which recommend best management practices in managing these pre weaned calves in transport. The only federal law that regulation, excuse me, that the United States has is the 28 hour rule indicating that animals cannot be transported for more than 28 hours straight. But there are several guidelines to help improve the welfare and reduce the stress of our newborn calves when it comes to transport, including the American Association of Bovine Practitioners, BQA Transport, Calf Care Quality Assurance, Dairy Calf Heifer Association, and the National Dairy Farm Program. And again, we're only talking about guidelines that we have, but good management practices that should be utilized, whether your pre weaned calf is hauled to a custom heifer raiser out west, maybe a couple of hours from the farm, or even to another location within just miles of the farm. And one of the key things is, are your calves ready for transport? And things to consider is the colostrum management program. Are those calves receiving adequate amount of colostrum in the uh, required amount of time and that's good high quality colostrum and Remember, our calf is born with a naive immune system. Basically, she's a sterile animal until she receives those antibodies through passive immunity through the transfer of immunoglobulins through colostrum. So we want to make sure we set her immune system up for success by making sure she has adequate colostrum management. A given is being able to identify those animals immediately before they go on to transport or immediately at birth so that we know which animals are which and ideally with a double ear tag system in case one tag gets ripped out. This helps not only you, but also the receiver know which animals they are receiving and have better track of those animals. Animals obviously needs vaccination protocols, um, both from a dam and the newborn based on the veterinary client patient relationship that you developed with your veterinarian and a vaccination program that fits your farm, but also maybe who the receiver of those pre weaned calves are, whether it's a custom heifer raiser or an individual that is raising them for beef. You want to meet those standards or meet those best management practices and vaccinations to help improve and have a good immune system. 
And then also many of these things getting calves ready for transport is really about processing the newborn calf. And we wanna make sure that we have proper navel care. And when we think about the navel, remember when she's in utero that we have nutrients and good things going into the calf through the umbilical cord and then waste leaving the calf from the umbilical cord. So at the time of birth, we actually have an opening still to the interior of the calf through that navel stump. And we need to properly care for that navel by disinfecting it and then also drying it, ideally with a 7% iodine tincture or equivalent solution. And this way we can help dry off that navel, seal up that navel opening as soon as possible so that we can reduce the amount of potential pathogens that can enter the bloodstream of the calf. And especially with a lot of stressors in new environments, we want to make sure that navel is uh, properly cared for and then managed. Another thing when we talk about if your calves are ready for transport is some of them may be going a long distance, especially out of state to a custom heifer raiser. And we want to make sure their tummies are full, especially if they're not going to have access to feed or water during transport. And to do that, we want to be able to feed them proper nutrition right before loading, but not less than an hour before transport. If we provide liquid feed an hour less than they go for onto the trailer, there's potential of that feed curdling in their stomachs and causing some uh -huh. digestive issues. So feeding them at least an hour or more before transport, making sure they have good colostrum management, identifying them, vaccinating, and making sure that navel is properly cared for will help reduce any incidences of health issues for the newborn calf. Now, we talked about getting the calf ready, but are you ready for transport? And we want to make sure that the environment that we're transporting a pre-weaned calves is properly uh, ready and set for those animals. Think about the transport design and the space that our calves are going to be hauled in. We want to ensure that the calves arrive at destination injury free. So making sure the interior of the trailer doesn't have any sharp objects or edges or broken sides that could potentially harm these calves. We also want to have a solid front to protect from the wind and reduce the amount of draft that could possibly hit those calves, especially in the winter months when we will have additional windshield with that wind. But also we want to remember that we want to provide adequate ventilation while minimizing draft in the winter, making sure that those calves have enough good, clean, fresh air uh, to breathe and then minimize a microenvironment that can cause respiratory disease. Protection from sun and excessive heat in the summer, and that could include transporting animals during the middle of the night on those extremely hot days, or making sure we have enough ventilation in there to help keep those animals cool. We want to wash and disinfect those uh, trailers between loads, if at all possible, so that we reduce the spread of disease from animal to animal, as well as from location to location. Clean, dry bedding is a must. And clean, dry bedding also not only provides a clean surface to lay on, but it also provides traction, as well as a soft, comfortable space for them to lay in, allowing manure or uh, urine to soak away from the animal towards the bottom, kind of providing that barrier for the calf while they're in transport. And it also provides a nice, comfortable area from away from the hard surface of the trailer. We want the uh, stocking density low and many different recommendations on what that uh, stocking density can be for those calves. But one rule of thumb is each calf needs to be able to lay down comfortably, lay down and be able to get up comfortably and not be stepped upon by other calves. So as you're looking at your trailers and uh, having calves, a lot of them will lay down as pre weaned calves because of, of their age, but they want them to be in an area so they can lay down comfortably without trying to disrupt another animal. Also, we have a lot of different um, age requirements or age recommendations for animals um, for time of transport and age. Uh, Vermont Advisory Group several years ago has a minimum of three days old at the eight time of transport. We've seen even upwards of four days, even uh, out, I believe the European Union is even looking at nine days of transport. And a lot of that is related to the care and the complete healing of the navel cord. But right now our best management practices based on some of our organizations here in the United States, a minimum of three days old at time of transport is the earliest we should do that. We also 
want to look at the length of time that she's on the trailer. Canada just several years, a couple of years ago, uh, changed their requirements to 12 hours at a time on the trailer at any given time before stopping for rest and water and uh, feed offered. And our calf care quality assurance recommends less than 24 hours on a trailer. So a lot of different information, not a lot of research, but yet a lot of good best management practices from organizations, as well as looking at some of the other countries that, that we support and work with can help us look at ways to improve animal welfare and reduce the stress of transport for these pre weaned calves. So with this, this next section, we'll have um, Erica Bierstrom, our Extension Regional Dairy Educator for Kiwani, Door, and Brown County, talking about fitness for transport on the market cows. Thanks, Tina. So moving on to the cows, and uh, we often think about sending cows out as, you can move to the next slide, Tina. We often think about cows as being a cull cow, and that's the word that we've all gotten used to for many, many years. And uh, a cull isn't really the, the kind of word that we want to associate with the cows that we're sending off of our farm for harvest. When we think about culling, we think of it as to reduce or control the size of something such as a herd, as we're talking about here with our dairy herd, by removal of slaughter. And that we're especially taking out weak or sick individuals. So when we think about it in a wild herd management, for instance, we have the chronic wasting disease in deer, and they specifically call that culling because they are removing those sick and weak individuals. We as dairy producers should think of this as a market cow. These market cows are something that you offer for sale. They have value. And according to Farm Bench, market cows or cows sold off the farm for slaughter make up about six and a half percent of total farm sales. So that could be for a dairy of about 250 cows could be somewhere in the range of 60 to $100,000 a year in sales. So uh, we, we want to think about those cows as something of value. So try to get that word in your head, market cows, as opposed to cull cows. And when cows do leave the herd, they leave for two reasons, voluntary for milk production levels or reproduction and involuntary. So those are the things such as disease or illness, injury, mastitis and lameness. The reasons that animals leave for health reasons in the herd, as you can see here, according to this National Beef Quality Audit, uh, quite a large amount of them leave for cancer eye, BAs and down for at least 24 hours. And of course, we know we can't harvest those cows if they've been down for 24 hours or down at all, really. And uh, these are, again, reasons they're leaving the herd for health reasons, uh, lameness and other diseases. And uh, other things that the cows leave, as I said before, according to an APHIS survey, Poor production is uh, counts for 22%, lameness for 15%, and other diseases about 9%. And then additional issues could be aggressive behavior and other uh, health issues that aren't listed here today. So moving on and talking about the market cow, the, as Tina said, the American, Bovine, American Association of Bovine Partic Practitioners have developed a set of guidelines for determining fitness for transport. And every farm should establish those set of standards in their herd with their managers and their veterinarians that result in marketing the best cow possible. And we'll talk a little bit more about what these practices are and what you should do in order to, for that cow to leave the herd. And cows leaving the herd should be ensured of their welfare until they are harvested. So next, we're going to talk about the American Bovine Practitioners Fitness for Transport Guidelines. And this is something that when you send a cow off your farm, you should really think about what needs to be done to this cow in order for her to be ensured her comfort until harvest, or if she's not fit for transport, then she shouldn't be put on the trailer. Cows should not have distended udders. A simple solution, <clears throat> excuse me, a simple solution to that is milking the cow before she leaves. 
Uh, no ambulatory issues. As you know, if a cow goes down, they're not going to harvest her and you're going to get the bill for the cow. So don't put a cow in a trailer that has some kind of ambulatory issues with the possibility of going down during her transport. Now, cancer eye or blindness, those cows should be euthanized before they leave the herd. No fever. So if a cow is showing signs of fever, taking a quick temperature and checking that before she leaves is a real simple solution to that. No potential drug residues or withhold issues. This is a big one. This is all about record keeping and make sure that you keep good records on your herd so you know who has what in them and for how long. No leg fractures or severe lameness. If those cows are severely lame or have leg fractures, don't put them on the trailer. Uh, no unreduced prolapses. Again, uh, the cow herself could or could not be stable, but I've seen this in, I used to work in a packing plant. I've seen this in many situations where a cow with an unreduced prolapse has been jostled around in the trailer and it has begun to bleed and she was bleeding profusely by the time she reached the packing plant. Don't put your cow in that situation. If she does have an unreduced prolapse, allow that to either reduce or euthanize the cow on the farm. Not currently calving or potential to calve. This kind of seems like a no brainer, but you would be surprised as to how many people actually do send very close to calving cows to the sale barn. So if the cow is going to calve, allow her to calve at home and then you can ship both of them if you'd like, but don't put that cow in the trailer if she's in labor. And then no visible open wounds. Again, that isn't necessarily a, a health risk for that cow, but it is very much dependent on how visible or excuse me, how open that wound is or how painful that wound is for the cow and whether or not that's going to cause her prolonged suffering during her trip. And dairy cattle, they make up about 20 to 25 percent of the U.S. beef market. And it's kind of a surprising number to people, but dairy cattle provide much of our ground beef, but they also produce a lot of other types of cuts of meat. And I'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. Uh, USDA reports that approximately 3 million dairy cattle, dairy cows are harvested for beef annually. And according to a beef quality assurance audit, about 75% of cow and or bull carcasses are sold as whole cuts, specifically rear leg round cuts. So those are the long, large muscles in the dairy cow. If we look at a dairy cow, they don't have a lot of muscle, but they do have that rear leg muscle and those are sold as uh, whole cuts to uh, markets and grocery stores. When we're talking about transporting these cattle, we need to take into consideration that they are not necessarily going to go to the packer right down the road. Uh, I am in the Green Bay area and we have two large packers right in town here and uh, the majority of the dairy cattle in this country are harvested in the upper Midwest, typically Wisconsin, uh, Pennsylvania, North Texas, Arizona, and California. And the reason for that is, is that's where the dairy cows are. So don't take for granted that just because you live 10 miles away from a packing plant, that your cow will be harvested at that location. Cows go to sale barns. They are specifically chosen by certain packers as to which cows they want. Some packers want extremely lean cows. Some of them want heavier cows. So don't just assume this cow is getting on the trailer. She's kind of marginal. I don't think that she's going to maybe last a day, but I think she can get to Green Bay. And that's not the situation. Those cows are sorted and purchased by certain packers, depending on what kind of condition they're in. So keep that in consideration. Keep that in mind. And we're talking about carcasses. Farm management practices have a lot of implications on the cow's second career. We talk about being harvested for beef as that cow's second career. And the National Beef Quality Assurance Audit said that 90% of dairy cows are too light muscled. We would expect that from dairy cows, but a lot of them going to market are on the light side when it comes to conditioning. So a body condition score average is 2.3. We'd like to see those dairy cows in, in good healthy production levels to be somewhere in that two and a half to three and a half 
body condition score. So we know we're sending cows a little bit on the light side. When they're lighter, they don't have as much condition. They're lighter in muscle as well. Also, bruising appears on 64% of cow carcasses. And that's kind of an astonishing number. We most of those bruises uh, occur shortly before the 24 hours before harvest. So a lot of that has to do with handling once they get on the trailer. And if a cow getting on the trailer is maybe a little unstable, she's going to get jostled around, get bruised, and that ultimately results in reduced beef quality. So moving on to the next slide, the National Beef Quality Assurance audit showed that dairy cattle have over twice as many rear leg injections than beef cattle have. And that is because dairy cattle receive significantly more injections over the course of her life than beef cattle do, but they are also receiving those injections in the wrong place. So those injections should be given in the neck as recommended by beef quality assurance and not in the rear legs. Le lesions are occurring in the high value rear leg cuts and that has to be cut and discarded from an already light muscled animal. So when you're taking an animal that only has three or 400 pounds of meat on it and throwing away its biggest cut of meat, you're really reducing the value of that carcass. And again, as I said, the 64% of cow carcasses are bruised and that needs to be cut away and discarded as well. And then, as I said before, bruising typically happens within those 24 hours of harvest. So once you get that cow in the trailer, you're not necessarily responsible for what happens to her after that, but you are responsible for putting a cow in the trailer that can handle the trip without causing additional injury to herself because of the condition she was in when she went on the trailer. And as Tina said, Transport is very complex and our transporters play a critical role in the health and the welfare of the cattle. So once they get on that trailer, as I said, you're not necessarily responsible for how those animals are treated or how they're, they're handled, but it is your responsibility to put an animal on the trailer that can sustain that trip in good health. And proper handling transport of cattle can reduce sickness and injury, prevent bruises, and improve the quality of the meat of these animals once they get to where they're going. And it is a best practice for transporters to be trained how to properly move cattle up and into a trailer and to remove them from the trailer and distribute them properly on the trailer, provide proper bedding, provide proper space, and employ the best hauling techniques that reduce the stress on the cattle. Now the five freedoms is nearly 60 years old. They are something that we try to abide by as people who raise dairy cattle or raise cattle in general or any animal. Uh, freedom from hunger and thirst and that is to have readily accessible water, fresh water, and help maintain health and vigor of those animals. And this isn't necessarily just in transport. This is wherever they are, wherever they're being housed, wherever these animals are residing at that time. The freedom of discomfort by providing an appropriate environment, including shelter and a comfortable resting area. And that includes not having things overcrowded, having clean, fresh bedding, dry bedding, uh, freedom from pain, injury, or disease. And this is something that you have a lot of control over, especially with those animals, these market cows that you're putting on the trailer. If you're putting a cow on the trailer that already is showing signs of pain, don't put her on the trailer. Let her have time to heal from whatever is paining her and give her some time to be prepared for that trip. Freedom to express natural behavior by providing sufficient space again proper facilities and a company of the animal's own kind. So again, animals that they're familiar with and maybe not putting them in with animals in an unfamiliar situation and freedom from fear and distress. So ensuring the conditions and treatment to avoid mental suffering of these animals. Mm -hmm.